thank you uh, so much for hosting the Oceania Rising Peace Pivot to the Pacific Tour and its last stop. And um, the Evergreen State College um, President's Equity Fund uh, brought our three speakers uh, tonight, but the connections really weren't made in academia, they were made in activism. Because about 10 years ago in Olympia, we were protesting the deployment of uh, striker armored vehicles to Iraq uh, through our ports, you may remember that. And at the same time on Oahu, uh, activists were opposing the uh, formation of a striker brigade and ended up defeating uh, that formation. And so we made some connections at that time. And uh, a few of us attended a conference in Honolulu uh, in which the Oceania Rising uh, student group presented this awesome uh, presentation of cultural performances, um, poetry, uh, about their various struggles. And what was so impressive about that and um, uh, moving was the solidarity that they showed to each other uh, from the Marshall Islands, from Okinawa, from Guahan, uh, from Hawaii, other places, because the military is engaged in the shell game to try and pit people against each other by moving forces around. So one person's victory in ejecting the forces may be another uh, island's loss. And yet they stood together and basically said, this isn't just about moving uh, forces around the Pacific, this is about demilitarizing and making the Pacific independent. And so what this tour is about is to make very clear that we here in the Northwest are also in solidarity with what's going on in the Pacific because the problem is coming from here. Uh, the largest base on the West Coast is Joint Base lewis McCord. Um, Army and Air Force Base, the naval bases are here too. They are the ones that since the Obama administration have been engaged in what's called the pivot to the Pacific, force projection into the Pacific directed against China, North Korea and others, but using these bases, um, these islands as bases. So um, we are trying to present the Pacific not as empty space that divides us, but as a rich place that connects us together. And one of the most important things you could do today, you'll hear about a lot of things you can be doing, but uh, they wanted to pull together uh, an email list. So in the back we have handouts with maps and uh, statistics and a call to action, resources, links. Um, but if you could please put your email uh, down, uh, they'll be in touch uh, with alerts and there's a lot of things coming up. Uh, some related to the military and some related to uh, protecting the sacred mountains. So um, I wanted to introduce the three speakers. And there's actually four speakers, one who can't be here, Kyle Kajihiro, uh, because of uh, family reasons, but he's uh, going by video. But uh, after that, it will be uh, Tina Grandinetti, who is a PhD candidate in geography at RMIT University in Australia. In 2017, she traveled to Okinawa and the Ryukyu Islands as a member of the Women's Voices, Women Speak delegation, all three speakers are part of that organization, uh, the delegation to the International Women's Network Against Militarism Gathering. As a biracial Uchinanchu or Okinawan woman who grew up in Hawaii, she's interested in nourishing transnational solidarity against imperialism and towards decolonial futures. Kisha Borja Kichocho Calvo is a PhD candidate in political science at the University of Hawaii Manoa. She's Chamoru from Guahan, uh, not Guam, you'll find out later on, part of the Mariana Islands, who's been very active in efforts to curb the military buildup there and in cultural work and poetry. Ruth Aloa is Kanaka Maoli from the Kona District. Her grandmother's lineage binds her to the island of Hawaii and her grandfather's to Maui. She is a Mahiai or farmer for Malu Aina Center for Nonviolent Education and Action and a Ki'ai Loko, or fish pond guardian for Kaloko Fish Pond. Her work extends to the peaks of Mauna Awakea, defending Mauna Kea Peak from the 30 meter telescope, to the plains of Pohakuloa, a military training area on the slopes of Mauna Kea, and to the deepest depths of the ocean to the realm of Kanaloa. So this event will be introduced uh, in a video by Kyle Kajihiro, former American Friends Service Committee staff member, now Hawaii Peace and Justice board member, founder of DMZ Hawaii Aloha Aina, 
and PhD candidate in geography at the University of Hawaii. So I'll run back and start that. Aloha mai kako. Um, warm greetings from US occupied Hawaii. Uh, I wanna first uh, thank and honor our indigenous um, peoples of the lands where um, our delegation will be hosted. Uh, the Squatchin Island, Nisqually and Puyallup and other Medicine Creek uh, Treaty tribes in the uh, Olympia area. Um, the Chimacuan and Skalalam, uh, where Port Thompson is now located. The Duwamish people in the area now known as Seattle. Um, and also the uh, Multnomah and Chinookan peoples uh, of the area where Portland is located. I wanna thank um, Zoltan Grossman, uh, Evergreen State, um, College, uh, Dan Shea, and, and all the other folks helped out um, to host and make this uh, speaking tour uh, possibility a reality. Um, so my name is Kyle Kajihiro. I'm uh, formerly a program director with the American Friends Service Committee, uh, Peace and Social Justice Organization in Hawaii, uh, and also um, board of directors of Hawaii Peace and Justice. Um, I'm currently a PhD a graduate student in geography and an instructor in the Department of Ethnic Studies. Um, so what I'd like to do today is uh, talk a little bit about the history um, and give an overview of the process of um, U.S. empire building and militarization in Hawaii and the Pacific, um, describe what that looks like, and talk about some of the sites where there's been resistance, some of it successful. So to start, um, begin with a quote from David Marlow, a Hawaiian historian, who uh, in 1837, he wrote that, when the high tide rises, large fish will come from out of the dark ocean, uh, from places you had not seen before. And when they see the small fish in the shallow place, they will eat the small fish. So here's a keen observer of history and of events. Um, and he's seeing imperialism gobbling up other islands um, so he writes this poetic, uh, this prophecy to Hawaiian chiefs, warning them of what's to come. What do these um, big fish look like? So one example we can see in uh, Senator um, Albert Beveridge from Indiana, who wrote in 1900, the Pacific is our ocean. The power that rules the Pacific is the power that rules the world. That power is and will forever be the American Republic. And so for a long time, the United States and its leaders have um, looked at Hawaii as a place that could uh, be useful for exerting power across this great ocean. In 2011, when the APEC summit was meeting in Honolulu, uh, President Barack Obama and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton were here and they unveiled this new US policy called the Pacific Pivot. Uh, but many of us who know this history of this region um, didn't see this as anything new. And as a pivot, to just play with this metaphor a little bit, every pivot needs a fulcrum on which to um, exert its force, to multiply its force. And so I would argue that Hawaii plays a similar role, that Hawaii is a fulcrum of U.S. imperial formation in um, the Pacific, and it helps to leverage U.S. power around this region and around the world. Hawaii is also a place where we see the pivot from a land-based power to sea power. And then Captain Alfred Mahan is one of the key strategists for this, where he advocated for taking of Hawaii in order for the US to have a foothold in the Pacific. In 1872, when General John Schofield led a delegation to Hawaii uh, who were disguised as tourists on a pleasure visit, um, they actually had secret orders to uh, scout out a location for a military base. And he reports that quote, it is the key to the Central Pacific Ocean, the gem of these islands. Um, of course, he's talking about Ke'avalao o Pu'uloa, or Pearl Harbor, um, which was a very important um, resource uh, and a sacred place to Kanaka Maoli because it uh, had so much fresh water mixing with salt water. It was a very abundant place for aquaculture and for wetland um, agriculture. Unfortunately, most people only know Pearl Harbor um, by images like this as a place of war, 
um, or as a memorial site and a um, tourist attraction. But very few know the older history of Kealvalao Pu'uloa as a Hawaiian geography of abundance um, and of the great um, sort of engineering marvels that existed there and a place of great beauty. Um, and the reason why it was so productive is in this map, you can see how 12 different land divisions or ahupua'a converge at the shoreline of Pu'uloa. Uh, and this means all the waters that come down from these two mountain ranges converge there and which gives it its fertility and its abundance where they would grow wetland taro and also raise varieties of shellfish, uh, fish, oysters. But the, um, around 1872 and 73, the sugar planters in Hawaii, uh, who are the white settlers here, um, wanted a free trade agreement with the United States so that they could sell their sugar without tariffs. Uh, and so they pressured um, the King Kalakaua to um, agree to a treaty of reciprocity. Um, and they suggested that uh, Pearl Harbor should be offered as an incentive to the United States. And so these white settlers uh, formed a militia and threatened uh, the king with violence if he didn't sign a new constitution that dramatically changed uh, balance of power in Hawaii. It empowered the white dominated cabinet over the monarch. Uh, it put property requirements on voting. So the majority of native Hawaiians were disenfranchised and it barred Asian um, immigrant workers from becoming citizens and having any rights in the kingdom. And one of the first acts of this new government was to um, ratify a second treaty of reciprocity, which granted the United States exclusive access to Pearl Harbor for a coaling station. Now, Hawaiians did not support this and they were very upset. So they petitioned uh, Queen Lilio Okalani, uh, the Kalakaua successor, to rescind the Bayonet Constitution. And as she was in the process of trying to do that, um, U.S. Marines were landed um, in 1893 uh, to basically back a coup d'etat by the white settler government um, elites. Uh, so U.S. forces surrounded the palace, pointed their guns at the palace, and um, basically uh, supported, they were the muscle that enabled a small group of white businessmen to take over. Um, this is where the broken relationship between the United States and Hawaii begins. Hawaiians um, organized uh, against this takeover and despite two attempts to annex Hawaii to the United States, both of them failed. Uh, the second time in 1887, 1897, uh, Hawaiians organized a, what's called the Kue Petition, um, a massive petition drive that represented almost 90% of the Hawaiian people opposed to annexation. They killed the Treaty of Annexation, um, but the following year, the war with Spain breaks out. And now, um, out of military necessity, the United States claims to seize Hawaii uh, so it could have a military base um, in order to send their troops to the Philippines. So as a result of this takeover, Hawaii becomes this kind of pivotal site in the expansion of the U.S. empire. Uh, which now spans from the Caribbean and the Atlantic Ocean all the way to uh, Asia. And that eagle has just morphed now into the uh, logo for the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, which is stationed here in Hawaii or headquartered here, um, the oldest and largest of the unified commands. Its area of responsibility spans all the way from the west coast of North America to the central Indian Ocean from Alaska all the way to and including Antarctica, uh, where most of the surface of the planet and majority of the world's population falls into its area of responsibility. When you look at the land um, that this encompasses in, in the islands, it's approximately 142 military sites um, encompassing about 225,000 acres of land. And this map you see the black areas are the current military, the dark gray, our former military lands. And if you look at the island of Oahu, um, about 25% of our land is under U.S. military control. Um, and so it's quite a high percentage. Uh, I think the only comparable other places are Okinawa and Guam. One way to think of it is um, the metaphor coined by Kaleko Kaeo, Hawaiian scholar and activist. Uh, so think of the military in Hawaii as the head of a monstrous he'e or octopus, which brains are the Pacific Command Headquarters, in Halava Heights, with 
with its uh, supercomputers and fiber optics as a nervous system. Uh, the eyes on top of our various mountains, watching the skies, um, tracking satellites and so forth. Uh, and the ears under the water and also in um, the radio facilities that are scanning and uh, collecting all of our electronic communications for the National Security Agency, which is where Edward Snowden was working. The excrement of this octopus uh, can be represented by the contamination of Pu'uloa, which was once a food basket, now a giant Superfund site, um, a whole toxic cocktail of chemicals and unexploded ordnance. And one example is the giant fuel tanks under Red Hill, uh, each one holding um, millions of gallons of jet fuel. Um, and 20 of these are located in this mountain. They're 75 years old. The quarter inch steel plates are corroding down to the thickness of dimes in some places. Um, and they're all leaking uh, 100 feet above the main aquifer that supplies fresh drinking water to Honolulu. So these are some of the hidden dangers that we face. There are many social and economic effects that spill over. Um, economically, Hawaii, the, uh, the military represents about 8.9% of Hawaii's gross domestic product. Uh, so it's a large part of our economy, but it's also a distorted economy because some people are getting paid while other people are paying the price, right? It benefits, uh, the benefits and, and costs are distributed unevenly. One example is how uh, military spending distorts the housing market. Um, housing subsidies going to military families make them better able to compete for rentals or for even purchasing homes. And meanwhile, that has an inflationary effect on the cost of housing, where um, Native Hawaiians are now the largest uh, group of, of homeless in their own homeland. Sexual exploitation and violence against women uh, are sort of an endemic problem to military bases all around the world, including Hawaii. And the tentacles of this um, he'e are reaching out and affecting other um, islands throughout our region, including Okinawa, Guam, uh, the Marshall Islands, Korea, and you'll hear about some of those from our other speakers. And as any fisherman would know, if you cut off a tentacle of an octopus, it can grow back. And we see this happening in the Philippines where U.S. bases were expelled and under the guise of a war on terror, uh, U.S. troops returned to Mindanao first and now um, they're expanding the presence um, at U Philippine bases. It's not all bad news, however. We've had um, uh, some very powerful uh, indigenous movements. Um, the key struggle in, um, that have, it was a, a source for many other struggles was the Protect Kaho'olawe Ohana, which emerged in 1976 to um, stop the bombing of Kaho'olawe Island, which was used by the Navy for uh, about 40 to 50 years. Um, Hawaiians occupied the island uh, with nonviolent direct action to stop the bombing. They filed lawsuits, uh, did political organizing. They were successful in stopping the bombing in 1990 um, and winning $400 million to help clean up the unexploded ordinance and restore the island. And now it's held in trust by the state of Hawaii uh, for um, Hawaiian cultural practice. Um, and eventually will become a land base for um, future Hawaiian nation. Koholobe can be thought of as a pico or kind of a source for the Hawaiian cultural renaissance, but also the Hawaiian sovereignty movement. And one of the key ideas to emerge from this struggle was aloha aina, which means literally love the land, but it also includes the people of the land. It includes relationships of, res of mutual responsibility and respect. And it has gone on to inspire other struggles including the struggle for Makua Valley on Oahu, which um, is also uh, occupied by the uh, U.S. Army since 1942. Residents were evicted, and it, it had been a long, uh, been a place of, of protests. Um, and in 1998, the um, Malama Makua organization sued the Army uh, under environmental laws and was able to win a settlement where uh, Hawaiians now have access twice a month for cultural use, uh, twice a year for doing makahiki ceremonies. And because the army failed to meet all the requirements of this agreement, including uh, comprehensive studies of the environmental effects and cultural effects of their practices, uh, the court imposed an injunction uh, 15 years ago. So there hasn't been live fire training in Makua for 15 years. And community uh, makahiki ceremonies have gone on for 18 years. So we think it's uh, only a matter of time before Makua will be coming back. 
and Pohakuloa on Hawaii Island, which you'll hear more about, is um, a, a site that's going to be absorbing or it's a target of more expanded training from the, all the service branches. So this is an area that's connected to uh, Mauna Kea, one of the most sacred sites in Hawaii, and the site of, of ongoing um, protests uh, against um, industrial telescope development on the mountain by the University of Hawaii. To just uh, close my talk, I just want to share this um, statement from Atwood Makanani, who is one of the um, uh, voyagers on the Hokulea, also a Protect Kaho'olawe Ohana member for a long time. He told me once, uh, you got a haku, and that's a Hawaiian word to mean compose or to, or you compose a lay or you compose a song or a chant, or you bring elements together into something. And so the way I interpret his meaning is that we need to haku together, bring together the, the individual strands of our struggles, whether it's in Guam, Okinawa, uh, of the Philippines, uh, right here in um, Washington and Oregon, um, weave them together into a cord that's stronger than its individual parts. And together they can weave a net that hopefully will be big enough and strong enough uh, to restrain the big fish that threaten to eat us all. Thank you. Hi, Sai, everybody. Um, my name is Tina Grandinetti. Thank you so much for being here. It's so nice to see so many people. We were really nervous and so nice to see so many young people. Um, I want to say thank you to our sponsors um, that helped bring us out here. Um, thank you so much to Phoenix and Zoltan for taking care of us tonight, um, to Veterans for Peace, um, and to all of the indigenous people of the Coast Salish Coast Salish region that whose lands we've been traversing over the last week, especially the Nisqually tribe who fed us really well today. Um, I'm just going to say that I have a really, I feel pretty confident that I'm going to cry tonight. <laughs> we've been talking about this for a week and it really gets to you. Um, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start by telling you a little bit about myself. So I am an Uchinanchu woman, but unlike Ruth and Keisha, I did not grow up in my homelands. I grew up in Hawaii, and that's where my demilitarization activism really grew. And it wasn't until very recently in 2017 that I um, came to my responsibilities as an Uchinanchu woman um, when I visited Okinawa for the first time as an adult with the International Women's Network Against Militarism. Um, so I'm not an expert, uh, but I do think that my story speaks to the ways that um, the military and imperialism catches indigenous people in its web and tries to force us to move through the world in certain ways. So my mother um, grew up in a town called Keen in Okinawa, right next to Camp Panson, and she moved to Hawaii when she was 23. Um, and then I ended up growing up not far from... Schofield Barracks Army Base, um, where I could feel my house shake sometimes during training practices and stuff. So my life ended up mimicking my, my mother's in, in certain ways. Um, um, so I'll start by telling you a story about that first visit to Okinawa as an adult and as an activist. Um, we were, it was the second day of this gathering of the International Women's Network Against Militarism, and we were driving on a bus from the capital city of Naha to a place called Henoko, which you might have heard of. It's the epicenter of the um, Okinawan anti-base movement at the moment. So we're driving on a nice air-conditioned bus, and I'm watching beautiful scenery pass by, and I'm also watching lots of fences pass by, fences marking off the land that the US military controls. Um, and then we, the bus slows down as we approach a small group of protesters holding signs like this one uh, that say, end the US, occupation, US and Japan occupation of the Ryukyu Islands, that's the original name of Okinawa, um, and no base expansion, things like that. Um, we get off the bus and we go from air conditioning to extreme heat, it's so hot and humid. Um, and we watched that small group of protesters join a much larger one of about 200 people, maybe a little bit more. Um, they're standing in front of a fence, and on one side of the fence, we see, we see Camp Schwab. Um, 
and Okinawan Defense Bureau officials dressed in uniform videotaping our every move. And then on the other side of the fence, there are the protesters fanning themselves. Some of them are sitting in chairs. Some of them are standing and facing down the guards. Um, but what's memorable, what's most memorable about this protest is that almost all of those protesters were over 70. And that, that really made an impact on me, seeing my elders um, putting their bodies on the line. And they really were putting their bodies on the line because just a few months later, one of the leaders of this movement, a woman named Suzuyo Takazato, who's in her 70s, she actually had a rib broken by one of the Defense Bureau officials. Um, I also tell you that because um, the age tells a lot, tells something really important about this movement. And that is that these protesters, they were alive during the Battle of Okinawa. They survived the Battle of Okinawa as children. And that experience from all those years ago still drives their commitment to peace. <clears throat> Here's a picture. I didn't, this, this wasn't the day I was there, but um, these elders do this every day, basically. They, uh, they um, uh, sit at the front of Camp Schwab to protest the base expansion that's happening which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, but before I do that, I want to tell you about the history of this struggle, because it's part of a much longer genealogy of resistance against Japanese and US imperialism. So in 1879, Japan annexed the Ryukyu Kingdom and turned it into Okinawa Prefecture. Um, and the Uchinanju people, the Okinawan people, were forced to assimilate. They were um, deprived of their self-determination and forbidden from speaking their language, forced to assimilate, but also positioned as second-class citizens of an inferior race. Um, let's see. Then during the Battle of Okinawa, I mean, sorry, during World War II, Japan decided to fortify Okinawa as a, as, to serve as a fortress against, uh, to protect the mainland. And because of this, U.S. and Japanese forces clashed on Okinawan soil. And during the Battle of Okinawa, which lasted a little under three months, one quarter of the population died. One quarter of the population was killed. And then after the battle was over, the US won and decided to use Okinawa in a similar way as it, as it used Hawaii as a uh, point to project its power into the Asia Pacific. So, they offered landowners um, rental payments if they were willing to hand over their land to, for use as U.S. military bases. And 98% of landowners refused. So that initiated what some people call the era of bayonets and bulldozers, when the U.S. military decided to use that land force. Um, so that he'e that Kyle was talking about wrapped a tentacle around Okinawa. Um, and its shit began to spread in the form of sexual violence against women, rampant sexual violence, so bad that the U.S. military had to respond because of the um, rapid spread of venereal disease through the troops. Um, also, environmental damage, um, and ultimately the disruption of ways of life that were very intimately tied to land. So... Um, under US occupation, a movement for reversion to Japan grew. And this was because Okinawans thought this is the best way to um, protect our human and civil rights. Um, they also thought this would be the best way of getting the US to withdraw its presence from Okinawa. But when reversion happened in 1972, these broader demands for demilitarization were ignored. So today, about 20% of Okinawa Island, the main island, are, is occupied by the military, and about 11% of the broader archipelago, the prefecture. That accounts for 75% of the US military presence in Japan, even though Okinawa only accounts for 0.6% of Japan's land base. So the broader anti-base movement in Japan was rooted in the US occupation, but um, the Henoko issue began in 1996 when three servicemen um, raped, beat, beat and raped a 12-year-old girl in Kin, the town that my family lives in. Uh, and then the U.S. 
military tried to protect these servicemen by delaying handing them over to Okinawan jurisdiction. And this really angered the Okinawan people because of this much longer history of sexual violence against our women. So 85,000 people mobilized in mass protests against um, the US military presence, and they demanded the closure of US bases. <sighs> so the US and Tokyo had to, uh, the US and Japan had to respond, and their response was a plan to close Futenma Marine Corps Air Station. This was really important because, uh, as you can see, Futenma Marine Corps Air Station is situated right in the middle of Ginawan City. It's known as the most dangerous airfield in the world. Um, residents had been fighting against it for so long because the aircraft fly straight over residential areas and the noise really impacts quality of life, but also because um, accidents happen and oftentimes um, Aircraft would fly overhead and something would go wrong. Parts would just fall from the sky into the schoolyards, sometimes killing people. So the closure of this base sounds like a win, except for it wasn't really closure. It was relocation to uh, a region called Henoko, which already hosted two bases. Um, the military planned to relocate the air station, not just in Henoko, but on top of Oda Bay which is the most, uh, which is a healthy living reef, the most biodiverse in Japan and possibly the world. The Okinawan people's demands for, for demilitarization had just resulted in plans for yet another installation on an already overburdened island. And for the past 23 years, people have been fighting against this plan, um, using all different kinds of strategies. They've been examining the EISs and pointing out really significant design flaws. They've been um, trying to call attention to the over 200 endangered species that live in Oda Bay, including the dugong, which is a marine mammal that looks a lot like a manatee and is very culturally significant, significant to Okinawans. Um, but on, after 23 years, on December 14th of 2018, construction, uh, actually, construction had already began of that seawall that you see in that picture there. Um, but on December 14th, they began to infill within that seawall, meaning they started dumping sand and soil right on top of Living Reef, doing irreparable damage. And this was just two months after the Okinawan people had had their elections and voted overwhelmingly in um, they voted overwhelmingly for a man named Denny T Tamaki for governor, and he's a staunch opponent of base expansion. So this was um, the Okinawan people demonstrating through democratic avenues that they didn't want this. And yet just two months later, construction began. Um, on a side note, Denny Tamaki called for a referendum to again try to show through de democratic means that the Okinawan people don't want this, and that's happening in a few days on February 24th. So that's something you might wanna look out for. Um, and this referendum and the, and the beginning of infill has really thrust this Henoko issue into the international news. Um, so I'm sure some of you might have heard a lot about it before, but what I wanted to point out from my time on the ground in Okinawa uh, is that something that's missing from most of the media coverage is that the media often frames this as an issue of unjust distribution. That the Okinawan people are saying, we make up 0.6% of Japan's landmass. Um, why should we carry 75% of this burden? And I, that's not necessarily a misrepresentation. That's, that's true. Many politicians um, and activists do frame the issue that way. But I think that the foundations of this movement go much deeper than that. And they, they're really rooted in a deep longing for peace. Uh, and that's because my people know from very brutal experience that Military bases don't make people safer. They don't make colonized people safer. They don't make anybody safer. Military bases are sites of violence and they produce violence. And this movement is led by elders who lived through the Battle of Okinawa and they know from experience that the very fortification of their islands was exactly what brought such horrific violence to them. 
And that's what I think is often missing in our, in our conversations about the geopolitics of empire. Um, that we're talking about people, we're talking about us. And that our, our indigenous peoples, we're offering a different way, we've been offering a different way. So I wanna share with you one of those different ways. Um, and it's uh, put forward by a group called Okinawan Women Act Against Military Violence. So if you remember, I told you about that elder Suzuyo Takazato who had her ribs broken. Um, that's her in the middle picture right there. She's a member of Okinawan Women Act Against Military Violence. And that group is part of the International Women's Network Against Militarism. And they have been fierce in their analysis of the military as a form of structural violence that threatens peace instead of protecting it. Um, and so they put forth this idea of drawing from, drawing from their experiences, but also the experiences of other women in that network, women from Hawaii, from Guahan, from the Philippines, South Korea, um, Puerto Rico. Uh, they put forward an idea called genuine security as opposed to national security, which is so often used as uh, to legitimize the taking of our land and, and water um, and the militarization of our ancestral places. Um, genuine security, they say, is articulated through four principles. I think they've added to this list, but um, the environment in which we live must be able to sustain human and natural life, people's basic survival needs for food, clothing, shelter, health care, and education must be met, people's fundamental human dignity and respect for cultural identities must be honored, and people and the natural environment must be protected from avoidable harm. <clears throat> I learned from these women also that genuine security has to be intergenerational. It has to be the grandmas and grandpas, the elders at the front lines of Henoko going there every day, but it also has to be young people stepping up when the time is right and that time being now. Um, it has to be transnational and transoceanic. And I say this because um, this is so important. Um, you know, because Okinawa's anti-base movement was so strong, uh, the U.S. had to address it. And one of the ways they decided to address it was by um, uh, downsizing the military presence in Okinawa. But they, but they're doing they. Their plan for doing this is to relocate um, originally 9,000 troops to Guahan and 2,700 to Hawaii. And that's unacceptable because those are our homes too. Uh, so when I heard that, when I learned that, I was really discouraged, you know, that ten that hey that Kyle was talking about, you cut off one tentacle and another one grows back before you even have time to think. And it grows back and wraps around other island homes, the homes of other indigenous people. Um, and for me, you know, Hawaii is my home maybe even more than Okinawa is. Uh, I want to share with you one more story. Oh, sorry. And it is on the same day uh, that we went to uh, the, the we went to see the elders. We drove past. We got back on the bus and we drove around Camp Schwab to Oda Bay, and we had the huge privilege of joining um, a, a flotilla of protesters. And they also go every day out onto the water. They're a group of fishermen and some young people on kayaks. Um, they ride straight up to this orange buoy that you see here that uh, marks off the construction zone where 1.2 million cubic meters of sand and soil are going to be dumped onto reef. The kayak is really, <laughs> it's kind of fun to watch if it wasn't so messed up, but the kayakers paddle over the buoy. Um, the Okinawan Defense Bureau chases them around in dinghies, sometimes hurting them. Um, detaining them for a few hours and then letting them go and then they do it again the next day. Uh, so we drove up with them, we watched that for a while and we also saw the crane um, that was, I think, building the seawall, constructing the seawall. Um, 
We watched the crane lift up huge loads of concrete, and then we heard that load crash into the reef. And that sound was really hard to hear. Oh, I knew I was going to cry. <laughs> um, and when I heard that, you know, I, I felt so overwhelmed. Um, I felt so angry that this is what happens to our, our places. And I felt really angry that... I felt really angry that what was most familiar to me about my homeland, because I don't have my language, I don't know that much of my culture, because it's really painful for my mom to talk about. So I don't know, I don't know very much. Um, what was most familiar to me was the fences, or the sounds of servicemen catcalling my cousins, my cousin and my sister and me in our own home our own hometown where my family has lived for generations. I felt so angry and I felt so overwhelmed. But then our captain, a man named um, Kushin Nakamoto, a fisherman in uh, Uchinaguchi, he told us that's called Umiacha, a seawalker. He offered us a chance to address the other protesters and the um, Okinawan Defense Bureau over his loudspeaker on his boat. Um, and I was too scared to do it. <laughs> oh, it's not. <laughs> but um, our friend and poet, Aiko Yamashiro, she was brave and she went up. And uh, I'm so glad that I recorded what she said because it stuck with me. And I have the exact words that I can share with you. Um, she said, uh, she, she also has ancestral ties to Okinawa but grew up in Hawaii. She said, our hearts are so sad because we are island people too. We thank the Okinawan people for protecting this place because we know it's the same ocean. And then she started weaving connections between Hawaii and Okinawa through what she learned from Kanaka Maoli leadership about Aloha Aina. And if you remember what Kyle said, Aloha Aina means love of the land, but it also means reciprocal relationships of care and respect between land and people and between people and people. She said, um, in Hawaii, we say aloha aina, and when we say aloha aina, we mean we love the land and we love the ocean because we know we are connected and we need it. And then she, she yelled out, Minasan, everybody, aloha aina, aloha aina, aloha aina. That's my sister chanting along with her. And as I, as I shouted those words along with Aiko, and I, I heard everyone shouting them across the water. I knew that the Okinawan Defense Bureau guards were listening. I, all of that, all of those doubts about what it means to be part of this movement, um, like, you know, is it my place as a Uchinanchu who didn't grow up in Okinawa to be here? Uh, what is my role as a non-native settler on Kanaka Maoli lands? All of those questions disappeared for a second um, because Nakamoto-san was fighting for his one small patch of ocean and Aiko was fighting for another, but it's the same ocean. And I want us to remember that, that the ocean connects us, that our, we, we talk so much about trying to connect our movements and it's so important, but like they're already connected. Um, and so most recently in, in the Henoko case, um, construction actually was semi-halted because they started drilling and they found out that the, sea, the seabed where they want to drill is too soft to provide any cult uh, structural integrity. It has the consistency of mayonnaise, that's what everyone's saying. And remember that that's after 23 years of the Okinawan people fighting against it. So that's after EISs. That's after people saying again and again, uh, this doesn't look right. I'm pretty sure this won't work. And you shouldn't be doing it here. <laughs> after 23 years of that, they didn't find out until they started drilling. Or maybe they did, but they figured they'd just do it anyways, and then it'd be too late to change anything. So... Construction hasn't actually stopped. What they've, been, what they've started doing is building a new seawall um, to mark off the new construction zone um, where they'll build. But um, that's going to require drilling 
76,000 piles into the ground to compact the sand underneath um, and drill, uh, drilling down to 90 meters or 90 meters above sea level, 60 meters um, into the seabed. And that's going to require approval from Governor Denny Tamaki, who, if you remember, is opposed. So that at least buys us some time. And I think that's really um, special because it reminds us that land has agency, Aina has agency, and that our lands have our back. Not all the time, and they, it doesn't always work out that way, but every once in a while we get these reminders that our lands have our back. Our, and I take a lot of comfort in that. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do while we're here is to start building those connections. And we reached out to one of the activists on the ground in Okinawa. He suggested that it would be really helpful to write letters or call um, members of the House and Senate um, Armed Services Committee to voice your opposition to construction at Henoko, or just go ahead and voice your opposition to the US military presence in Okinawa. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's one small way that we can protect our lands and waters and help grow the connections between our movements. Thank you so much, Nihei Debiru. Um, Banas San Hafade from Guahan, Guahan Sikisha Baraki Tsukalvo. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Keisha. Um, thank you so much for coming um, and staying here on a what day is it? Thursday? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been traveling everywhere. Every time we wake up, we're in somewhere different. It's Thursday, right? Yes, yeah, so Thursday night. So I'd just like to acknowledge uh, and thank, first of all, the first peoples, indigenous peoples of these lands that we get to visit. Um, and also thank you to Zoltan Grossman for being our host and our great driver throughout this whole time. Um, and to Phoenix, as well as Veterans for Peace for hosting us, and to all of you uh, for coming. This is a really great turnout. Thank you um, for coming. So I'm going to start off with a poem. <clears throat> and it's called Reoccupation Day, AKA Liberation Day. Oh, I need to give a shout out to all the Chamorros or anyone from the Mariana Islands. I know there are people here. Yay, Viva! Um, I actually got a little extra nervous when I was telling my sisters. I was like, oh no, I can tell they're from the Marianas. And they're like, that's okay, that's great. I'm like, ugh. Um, yeah, so if you're from the Mar if you're from Guahan, you know we celebrate Liberation Day on July 21st. So it's the day that in 1944, when the Americans came back after uh, and freed Chamorros from the Japanese occupation. So uh, there's a famous Chamorro activist named Unghit Santos, and he calls Liberation Day Reoccupation Day, the day the Americans came back to reoccupy us. So yeah, this is that poem. Every 21st of July, the people of Guahan march in their red, white, and blue, thanking Uncle Sam and his men in uniform. The Chamorro people were freed from over 300 years of forced Catholicism and forced last names, from bowing to Yukois and forced death marches, yet they continue to be occupied by the spam craze golden arches, by drafts and recruitments by the land of the free. They took Sumai and used it for their military. They made us citizens but denied us the vote. They stole our language and made us speak English. But our history books say that we're free, that we're making good money from tourism and militarism. But as I drive through Tumhom, my view of the ocean obstructed by the outrigger and the Hyatt, I think of the stories Tata used to tell me about the Ladi stone huts that once lined the ocean and how they were bulldozed to keep up with the times. No trespassing signs now line the ocean. My people are not free.
So I'm going to focus on militarization in the Mariana Islands, um, focusing mostly on Guahan only because that's the island that I was born and raised on, um, and I don't feel 100% comfortable speaking on behalf of the other islands, but I'll share some of the general information about militarization in the other islands. Um, so just to kind of contextualize space, um, <clears throat> of course, Washington would be over here. <laughs> um, if you can see Hawaii in the top right, and then to the left of that, you'll see also in the North Pacific is the Northern Marianas and then Guahan. You'll notice that they're separated, um, and that's because we have a different political relationship with the United States. So all of the indigenous people of the Mariana Islands are Chamorros, not <clears throat> Guamis or Guamanese or Guamericans. Um, we're all Chamorros, okay, so, um, but we just have a different political relationship, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, this is a map of the Mariana Islands, <clears throat> and so we have about 15 islands in the Marianas. Guahan is the southernmost island in the Marianas, um, and people mostly reside in Guahan, uh, Luta, Aurora, Tinian, and Saipan. Um, but then people also travel to the other northern islands for different reasons, like fishing and uh, things like that. So in terms of military occupation, the U.S. military um, occupies lands in Guahan, as well as Tinian, Ferian de Medinidza, that's a Spanish name clearly, <laughs> it's noos for our, our language, um, they occupy that for, uh, or use that island for um, training and testing, bombing, and then right now, in north of Ferian de Medinidza is Pagan, P-A- G-A-N, um, they are proposing to use that island as well for um, live fire training. So as I mentioned, our indigenous peoples of all the Medianas are Chamorros. Um, and you'll hear me say Guahan um, and not Guam because Guam is the name that uh, Americans renamed our island and that has no meaning to our people. Um, Guahan has meaning, it means we have or to have. So um, just a quick overview of our colonial history. Guahan is the oldest colony in Oceania or in the Pacific. We were colonized um, unofficially from 1521 when Magellan landed on the island, but officially 1668 to 1898 uh, by Spain. And then 1898 to 1941 by the US Navy, um, 1941 to 1944 by Japan. So whereas, as Kyle mentioned, um, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor or Pu'uloa on December 7th, 1941, on the very same day, it's December 8th because we're on the other side of the international date line, but on the very same day, Japan bombed Guahan, um, but occupied the island for three years. 1944 to the present, we um, first were under the US Navy again, and then we ended up, uh, we're currently under the US Department of Interior. The Northern Mariana Islands has a little bit of a different trajectory. Um, they were colonized by Spain, but then after the Spanish-American War were sold to Germany. Then were under Japan for a longer period of time. And now they have commonwealth status with the United States. Whereas Guahan is an unincorporated U.S. territory, meaning we have um, American citizenship, but we don't have the right to vote for the U.S. president, and we have a non-voting delegate to Congress. Right? Which brings up a lot of, like issues when, you're, when we're talking about militarization in our, in our community. So in terms of Guahan more specifically, this map, um, I'm pretty sure you can't see all the words, but just look at the colors. The darker shaded areas are the parts that are currently occupied by the US military. So we have an Air Force base up in the north and then naval base in the south. Um, <clears throat> Guahan is about 30 miles long, eight miles wide, about 170,000 people. Um, and so they occupy about one third of our lands. Right after the war, they occupied two thirds of the lands, but um, because of that issue being very contentious, Chamorro landowners fought for lands. And so they said, okay, we'll give back some of it. And they gave back a third, but they still owe land um, to other landowners. Um, so what does militarization look like, right, in Guahan? It looks like that. And I like to tell people that it's like they took a cookie cutter and they put a cookie cutter all throughout the island and took all the good, like the really beautiful parts of our, of our island. And then they just left us with some of the scraps, right? Some of the harder places that, um, you know, that are not so easy to access. Um, they took all of our really, really beautiful, pristine beaches. Um, and I'll show you pictures of one of those areas later. It also looks like the presence of PCBs and Agent Orange, um, which have become really 
hot topics uh, lately in our community because we have really high rates of cancer. Um, with the PCBs, there was an article that came out just last week or two weeks ago in our local media that talked about how off the shore of one of our southern villages, Malesu, there's about 4,900 times the accepted federal um, recommendation for PCBs in that area. Um, and so they're telling our people now, well, they, our elders have been telling us for a long time, don't swim there, don't fish there. But now officially the military is saying, don't go there. Um, and so, yeah, but there hasn't really been any talks yet on cleaning up this area. Um, and then there are current bombings of Noos, which I have a video to show. Um, Gosh, I watch that video so many times and it gets me every time. Um, so the rationale behind bombing Noos is that there are no real substantial like presence of humans living on the island. Um, so despite the fact that there are rare <clears throat> animal species such as our birds and as well as um, plant species, that doesn't stop the military from conducting these kinds of training. So um, yeah, human life is what they're concerned about. So what else does militarization look like in the Marianas? It looks like a proposed military buildup. So as I mentioned earlier, the military already occupies one third of Guahan for a naval base and air force base. Now, as Tina mentioned, they're proposing to relocate Marines um, from Okinawa to Guahan as well as their dependents and thousands of um, foreign laborers, mostly from the Philippines. Um, so originally in 2006, when the draft, I mean, uh, when people started to talk about the, the buildup, um, the original number of Marines was about 8,000, 9,000, uh, and then 9,000 dependents. Um, and remember, you have about 170,000 people. So altogether with foreign laborers, uh, dependents, servicemen and servicewomen, it would have been almost 50,000 people which is almost a third of our population, just increasing our population with a very sh within a very short uh, time span. So our community got together um, and read the draft environmental impact statement. It was about 11,000 pages. And we had about one month to read and comment on this document. Um, and we asked for more time, so they gave us three, three months to read. 11,000 pages. Um, but we still submitted 10,000 comments. And so I guess they kind of heard, they kind of listened because they lessened the number of Marines and dependents that they're relocating. And so the only problem now is more either stay in Okinawa or they go to Hawaii as well as to California, right? So again, right, as we're, like, one of our standing themes amongst our, you know, as we're trying to build solidarity is we just keep being pitted against each other, our, our different communities and our different movements. Um, and and it's, we really need to stop that. Um, so yeah, it looks like now 5,000 Marines, 4,000 dependents, still foreign neighbors that we need, as well as the construction of a Marine Corps base. So this is a really contentious issue, this military buildup, because most of the people in our community in Guahan have spoken out against this buildup. And yet it's like plans are still moving forward despite this resistance. Um, and it's really frustrating because it's like we're not being heard. And one of those reasons is because of our political status as an unincorporated territory, right? So we have no one to speak for us in Congress. Um, we have no, yeah, no representative to go and help us out there. Um, and usually when these decisions are made, like at the table, we're not invited to the restaurant, right? We're not invited to look at what's on the menu. Um, it's just United States, Japan, 
um, and Okinawa who get seats at the table and they get to talk about what they want to do with places like Guahan and Pagan and Tinian. Um, and so that's a really big issue because right now they're already proposing the Marine Corps base, even though, I mean, uh, building the Marine Corps base, even though we've resisted against it. Um, but on a, I guess on a light, lighter note, they decided to name it after a Chamorro. So I guess that's supposed to make us feel a little bit better. Um, they're proposing a hand grenade training facility, a live fire training range complex um, at a village called, uh, which would impact a village called Litekzen. And then the continuous demands for use of ocean, land, and air spaces for different trainings um, in addition to this buildup, which I will talk about in a little bit. So Pagan, as I mentioned earlier, when I showed the map of the Medianas, the military is proposing live fire amphibious training at the highest level. And then in Tinian, where the military is already occupying land, they want to actually um, engage in the ha second highest level of live fire training in t on two thirds of that land. <clears throat> this is Li Tekzen. This is how Li Tekzen looks right now. Um, so right now Li Tekzen is under the US Fish and Wildlife. Um, and so what's happening now is they're kind of just switching right, control of this space to Department of Defense. Um, and so, they're going to use the Texan as kind of like a buffer zone for a live firing range nearby. Now in this village, there are ancient burial sites, there are cave drawings that our ancestors created, and then on the top left, these are our sacred stones. Some of the stones are laddie stones, which are kind of 6 feet to 13 feet high stones that our ancestors built our homes on top of. Um, some are lusung, which is what our ancestors used to pound our traditional medicine. Um, so these are artifacts that have been there for thousands of years um, that the military is choosing to destroy. Um, there is a movement now to, to stop this uh, land from being taken again because one of the other contentious issues behind this is that this land still, Ch original Chamorro landowners are still waiting for their land back here in this place. So now if it goes back to the Department of Defense, then it just becomes, they become further disconnected from ever even going back to that land. Um, in addition to the military buildup with the Marines being transferred over to Guahan, we are also currently experiencing um, and trying to fight against the Mariana Islands training and testing, as well as the Mariana Islands range complex. So the Merc, it's also called the Merc and the MIT. Um, the MIT overall is basically just an expansion of the Mariana Islands range complex. So it's about 1 million square nautical miles of ocean and airspace that the US Navy wants to use for their testing, um, including sonar training and um, bombing. And then as you can see, there's a dotted line which goes from the Mariana, the area surrounding the Mariana Islands is the dotted line, goes all the way to the Hawaii Island range complex. So it's a lot of space um, that the US Navy plans on using for their practice and their training purposes. Um, so you're looking at 12,580 detonations every year for five years, and the takings of thousands of different marine mammal species. <clears throat> but it's not all hopeless. There is resistance going on in the Marianas, um, including Guahan and Pagan and in Tinian as well. And some of the more formal kind of organizations are a group called Protehili Texan or Save Rutidian. So that going back to that, those pictures of that village that's um, being considered for like a buffer zone area, there's a movement. You can follow them on social media, um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, in the bottom right, there's a group called We Are Guahan, and We Are Guahan is responsible. It's one of our wins with this buildup. Originally, instead of Litekzen being kind of threatened, there was another village called Pogget that was um, that the U.S. military wanted to use for their live firing range. Um, but the We Are Guahan and the Guam Preservation Trust they sued the Department of Defense and won that lawsuit. Um, and so that's a win, right? Like they, they were like, we're not going to touch that. You can have Pogget back. 
Um, but then they decided to now threaten Li Tekzan, so that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, there's a larger kind of reg trans-oceanic regional movement called Our Islands Are Sacred, um, and that's another group that you can kind of follow, looking at kind of building solidarity between other different communities um, in terms of military and also protecting other sacred spaces like Mauna Kea. Um, so in terms of how you can help us, um, I would say just to learn more about U.S. militarization in the Medianas, or even just learn about the Medianas. Um, we often get kind of neglected as part of this American fabric um, because we are unincorporated territory or a commonwealth. Um, and so often people either don't know where we're talking about, right, <laughs> who we are, <laughs> or like when the missile, you know, when North Korea threatened where, do you remember where they threatened to send the missile? Which island? In 2017? Guahan. Guahan, yeah. All of you should have answered that because Guahan is a part of America, folks. Um, but yeah, so the North Korea threatened to send the missile to Guahan just in 2017. It's all over the news. Maybe not here. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> But uh, Fox News, um, it was really interesting because Fox News put out, uh, there's like someone screenshotted it that they put only 200 Americans' lives were at risk. 200. <laughs> so the rest of us in Guam were like, hey, what about us? Like, I thought we were American too. Clearly we're not. Um, so yeah, it's learn more, right? And learn more about these, these places, learn more about our contentious history as well as our current occupation by the United States, not just in terms of military, but even other kinds of facets of our community. It's really important. So that way, when you meet somebody from Guahan or Saipan, or you don't say like, oh, you know, I, I went to Guam and I was stationed there like, you know, when I, when I was in the Navy or, oh, my grandfather was stationed there after the war. Like that should not be the first thing that pops out of anybody's mouth when they hear that someone is from Guahan. It's so offensive. Like my ancestors, our ancestors, like we are way, we're millennia older than U.S. occupation. U.S. occupation started in 1898. We were there thousands of years before that, like building things that no, like no American when they came could figure out how we constructed. So we are a amazing people. So next time, you know, when you meet somebody, like let's try not to let that be the first question, uh, maybe not even the second, uh, or bring it up at all, I guess. Um, the other thing, this is this is one reason why uh, one one way I, I really feel people could help is to read the MIT Environmental Impact Statement. The military gave us about a month. Yeah, I think it came out February. No, maybe early in February, M month and a half. Yay, that's a lot of time. To read this impact statement, environmental impact statement, and to submit comments by March 18. Um, this MIT is the one I was talking about, the one million square nautical miles, all of that. Um, if you are an environmentalist, you have a lot of knowledge about environment, health impacts, um, that's the part we really need help with, because this it's, you know how that is when you're, you know, you read environmental impact statements. There's so much information. It's very overwhelming, um, as it sh as it can be, as it as it is. Um, but they're not having what do they call them? They're not calling them public hearings. They're calling them I forget what the name is. But they're having the community basically go um, to these public spaces, and they're gonna just be posters up about the MIT. Um, and then like representatives by the posters. So there's no public hearing for this. As much uh, damage as this is going to have on our environment, on our health, on our culture, there's no, co there's no hearing, no or like we can't vocalize um, against this. So the only other way to kind of participate actively in this process would be to submit comments. Um, and yeah, please, I ask if you're able to read a little bit and articulate something um, within this short time, please help us by submitting comments because that would be a really great help. Um, yeah, we need all the expertise and knowledge and experience. You know, a lot of you too are veterans, like you know what kinds of impacts these kinds of things can have on communities. The other thing is just to follow Protehi Lake Texan or um, uh, our islands are sacred on social media. And I think that's it. So I'm going to end with a poem. Started with a poem. This is my daughter. 
Oh, she's five now. <laughs> yeah, not so all. Everybody's like, oh. Yeah, no, she's cute. She's cool. Um, so yeah, that was when she, she was just born when we took this picture. Our islands are sacred had like this social media movement. And I was like, oh, let's go, let's go put her in a basket and put her by the ocean. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So this is called Our Islands Are Sacred. And this is for all of us um, who come from sacred places, sacred peoples. Honor our ancestors. Honor our sacred spaces. Honor our past. Remember those who came before us. Remember those who will come after us. Remember those who are living. Respect our peoples, our animals, and our plants. Respect our lands and our ocean. Respect our stories. Protect our ancestral graves. Protect our stones. Protect our mountains. Protect our trees. Protect our past so we can protect our future. Chant our stories until our children hear us. Chant for our lands and our ocean until they feel us. Chant to our ancestors until they know us. We are here. We are here. We are here. And we remember now. You are sacred. We are sacred. Our islands are sacred. Thank you. Sito Asmasi. Oh, hana uta mauna kia o kua e ka mauna na kia. Kane, oh papa, oh papa, valin u kawahine. Hana ho ho ku hewahine, hana o halo heli. Hana o kamauna, he keiki mauna na ke. Eo wakia. Aloha mai kako. O Ruth Aloha Ko'u Inoa, O Mauna Awa Kea Ku'u Mauna, O Kona Ku'u Aina Kupuna, O Kaloko Ku'u Loko, O Kono Kaimalino Ku'u Kai. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having us. Uh, giving thanks to the first peoples of this land, to the ancestors, to the elements, the sacred elements that have granted us safe passage. Uh, to our wonderful and gracious hosts, thank you for helping to bring this space. To Zoltan for being with three mana wahine for about a week straight. Mahalo. Uh, and thank you to all of you for being here. It's late. I'm going to try and make this interesting. So you guys are real lucky. Okay, I'm going to tell you everybody why you're lucky. Okay, you're lucky because I never prep a talk. I don't have a PowerPoint for you. I used to go to grad school. I graduated. I didn't drop out. They made me want to drop out because they harassed me, but I finished. Couldn't let them take it over, right? So an elder told me, he said, you know, Ruth, you know what you need to do? You know, Loke, you need to follow your na'au. You have to follow your ancestral wisdom. So right over here, if you rub your tummy, that's na'au. That's for us as Kanaka. That's a very sacred, sacred place. That's one of the sacred realms of our body. And so ever since then, ever since he challenged me, I've been trying to challenge myself. And so I go into prayer before I speak. So everything that's going to come out of my mouth is meant just for you. Because I prayed on it. And I asked for help. And so the chant that I just provided you with uh, is a chant, Hanau uh, Kamauna, and it talks about my genealogical connection, our genealogical connection, Kanaka Maoli, Native Hawaiians, um, to Mauna Kea, a very, very sacred place. And I know that there are Kanaka in this crowd, Eo, see you in the back too, um, that I'll tell you about. And I'm also here to talk to you about Pohakuloa, a military base on my island, Hawaii Island. So my name is Ruth Aloa. My Mauna that I'm calling in today is Mauna Awa Kea. My ancestral district that I claim, that I come from, my grandmother's lineage, is Kona. And within this Kona district, uh, that is where this fish pond that I love, I'm a kia'i loko, fish pond guardian. I'm a mahi'i'a, I'm a farmer for the sea, so we stock ponds so we can release them, so that the future generations can eat. And so my fish pond is Koloko. And uh, my seas, the name, one of the names of my seas is uh, the Kona Kaimalino. And it's a very, very calm water compared to the east side of the island. Uh, very beautiful, beautiful, sunny, sandy. So that's me, that's who I am, that's where I come from. 
So one thing we've been sharing about when we talk is we've been talking about our roots of activism. And I see a lot of young faces, which I'm really stoked about, because I need you, we all need you, and we all need each other. And so who in here loves love? People love love. I need to see hands going up, because if we're going to have some peace, we need to have love. All right. Okay, who loves to read stories about gods and goddesses? Traditional stories. All right. I'm loving the hands. I'm liking the crowd. I hope you guys love me back, because I'm going to need it. <clears throat> so I fell in love with a beautiful Manawahine, a female, who literally looked like a goddess from our sacred mountain. She did. And you guys are smiling. You're like, no, this isn't true. Like, nobody's that beautiful. No, she is that beautiful. And I was that lucky. And I like to think she was lucky too. <laughs> but anyway, when we first met, some of the first things that we did was we took each other to our traditional places, our sacred places. And those were our first dates. I learned the name of her winds and her rains, and she felt my lands and worked in our fish pond. And it was a very, very sacred connection. Sadly, we're no longer together. However, <laughs> we're still friends. We're working on it. Um, I'm glad to hear you guys laughing. I'm putting a lot out there, so I'm very vulnerable when I speak. I have nothing to be ashamed of because my life is in the God's hands. And so going back to this love story. Anyway, when we first met, we were real cheesy. Mmm, ancestral love cheesy. We made up all kinds of stuff, but it was beautiful, right? It felt divine. It felt like a love story that you read about that can no longer happen today, where the elements dance when you are together because they want you to be together so badly. That's the kind of love that I had. And I'm hoping I have it again. <laughs> okay, not, that's enough about me. All right. So when we met, what did we tell? So well, some of the sayings that we had, which I'm going to share, is uh, we tell each other, because she had a mountain. It was her mountain that I fell in love with. And she fell in love with my sea. So we tell each other, Ko mauna, your mountain. Ku'u mauna is my mountain. And ko kai, your ocean, ku'ukai, is my ocean. Meaning that she would stand with me to protect the places that gave me life, and I would stand with her to protect the places that gave her life and continue to. And so that is where the roots of my activism come from. It comes from love, and it's born out of literally aloha aina, love for the land. And that's why we can still be friends. <laughs> because we have to, we don't have a choice. <laughs> and by choice, I hope. All right, so now let's get serious, because this is a very serious topic. All right. So I don't have a PowerPoint, so I try my best to just bring you with me where I go. And if you've ever been to Hawaii Island, it's called the Big Island. Uh, that's the island that I am from. We're the biggest island. We're farthest south. Um, largest in size, anyway. I think biggest would be argued by other islanders. Um, but if I'm standing on my island, and I'm standing in the center of my island, which is like the center of your palm, and right before me, there's a great mountain, and this mountain is called Mauna Awakea, Mauna Kea. It stands 13,000 feet above sea level. Right now, where I'm standing, it's about 28 degrees. It's freezing. We have snow on our mountain. It's been snowing like crazy. It's very, very cold. The winds are whipping, 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 whipping. So we have winter gear on, folks. We're not going to be out there in Hawaii clothes. That doesn't exist on the mountain. Behind me is Mauna Loa. She's another mountain, very, very beautiful. We have five mountains. She's real chic. She's like heels. She's like heels in a tight dress. That's how beautiful she is. So we characterize our mountain like women, of course. Uh, maybe that's because I'm mahu or queer, but it's okay. All right, so if I look to my left, I'm going to turn my body and I see Mauna Huala Lai, and that is my mountain that feeds my fish pond. And right at the base between these three mountains is a sacred place called Pohaku Loa. What that means is whenever I talk about a place, I'm usually talking about it as an ancestral connection. Pohaku Loa is the name of a god. Pohaku Loa is my god. The name Pohaku Loa has been appropriated by the US military, and it's called Pohaku Loa Military Training Base. And at this base, it's 133,000 acres large. That's how big it is. It's the largest base in the Pacific. It's still used for live fire training. And so if you remember that video earlier with Kyle, the US Navy cracked a water table on Ko'olawe. After doing that, you think they would learn, right? They haven't learned. They're bombing my home island that is home to about 190,000 individuals. And where they're bombing sits an aquifer that feeds every single district. So for the past year and a half, two years, 
I've been on a hunt. The military likes to hide their records. And then whenever you click on their website, they always want to get into your computer. So I looked and I looked. And what was I looking for? I was looking to see, OK, is the military that stupid? Like, would they really bomb an island and not assess the seismic impact of those bombs dropping on our aquifer? So I looked and I looked. And it was, if you've ever tried to find material from the US government, it is very, very hard. So what did I go to? I went to one of their outreach. They put up, you know, like how Keisha was talking, they have their science posters and, you know, these official officials standing by them. I said, you know what, I'm going to go to these because they don't want to hear us, so I'm going to try and find this answer. Like, one of these fools got to get the answer for me, right? So I go there and I'm working my way around the table and I say, I, I ask the first individual, would you happen to know, you know, where I could find this information about somebody bombing our aquifer? They said, you need to go talk to the guy who organizes the bombing at the base. Go to that table. I go to that table, it's a poe haole, it's a white man, he's been here for like two months. I'm not making this up. I go there and I ask him, hey, that other individual over there said I should come here. They said you would know if the US military has assessed the impact of the bombing that you folks are doing on our aquifer. Have you measured the seismic impact of that? And he tells me he doesn't know. He doesn't have that information. And I tell him, you're telling me you're the guy that is organizing the bombing on our sacred lands and you don't know you haven't assessed the impact to our aquifer? Who do I have to talk to? He said, go talk to that guy. So one thing I learned too is I call them by name. His name is Fleming. They need to be recognized for the hell that they are doing. Let's recognize them as rightfully so. I go to Fleming. Hey, Fleming. So that guy over there, that new guy, he told me to come to you and ask you, do you have information about this, the bombing on our aquifer and what the impacts are? And he's been there for years. And he tells me no. So right now, on Hawaii Island, my island is being bombed by the US military, like many of our other sacred lands. Um, and like they told Keisha's people, nobody lives here. It's OK. People live on my island. Some of the first sounds that babies in the womb and young children hear are the sounds of bombs dropping. It's crazy. It wakes people up in their sleep. And it's happening. And it happens all around the island. Our whole island can feel it. So that kind of upsets me. That upsets me a lot because I don't think the US military has a plan to relocate 190,000 individuals. And that shouldn't even be a question. So when we're looking at Pohakuloa, there's other things. And I can't go over everything because like everything, there's so much information. So how did they get this land? Shortly after we became a fake state, a lot of our lands were taken from us. And that's about 80,000 acres. That's offensive. That pisses me off, but you know that's a lot of Native people's history. Then the state of Hawaii, now if you think Hawaii is all palm trees and pineapples, it's not. A lot of our people are going homeless and houseless. We're underfed, we don't have good education systems. Our elders don't have proper Medicare, we're overflowing. Waiting rooms are turning into hospitals because there just isn't any place to put us. They lease, the state of Hawaii leases 22, more than 22,000 acres for less than one penny a piece for 65 years to the US military. And if you've ever tried to rent in Hawaii, you'll be lucky to find a shoebox worth 1,200 a month. And the US military is being leased land, again, I'm gonna say this because it pisses me off so much, 22,000 acres for less than one penny a piece for 65 years. And all I can think is, what if we lease that land to the people, to the farmers, to the people who love the land, to the people who want to help, like I assume every single one of us in this room. Other things that are happening at Pohakuloa is depleted uranium. There's a toxic waste in the middle of our lands. That's an issue. What makes it a bigger issue is the fact that the US military hasn't investigated the full ex expansion of that depleted uranium in this area. Another issue with live fire training, they bomb, arrows get lit on fire, that activates the depleted uranium. It gets particles are lifted into the air in the center of our mountain. The winds come, it's a wind tunnel, and the winds carry it to the towns. And so our people get sick. There's higher rates of cancer right down slope from the people who are receiving these winds. But if you ask the military, there's no problem. Nothing's happening. And I think that's the, that's the answer in many places. So that's Pohakuloa, a very, very, very dear place to me that I love and that I hope you folks remember that name, Pohakuloa, and you remember the other names that are being spoken because those are the names that matter. And now I'm gonna turn my attention to that mountain, 
the mountain that taught me about ancestral love that I'm just yearning so much for. I'm on the hunt. Anyway, so this mountain, how many of you have heard of Mauna Kea? Yeah, how many of you have heard of the We Are Mauna Kea movement or the indigenous struggle on the island? All right, so I'm a Kia'i, look, I'm a Kia'i Mauna as well, a guardian of the mountain. What does that mean? Uh, that means that I'll do my very best in peace and nonviolence to keep our mountain safe. And so in that chant that I opened with earlier, it talks about this sacred mountain as being a genesis point for our people. What does that mean? It's a birth point. It's where we descend from. And this mountain already has telescopes on it. It's been built on since the 70s. We've always resisted. There's many reasons why this telescope, the 30 meter telescope, is the tipping point. And I can't go into detail over all of them, but I'm just gonna give you a brief overview. Environmentally, there are endangered species, insects and plants that are found nowhere else in the world, only on our mountain that are not being adequately considered. Now we're gonna look at legal arguments. I'm telling you this because people always say, this is science versus culture. No, 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 that's not the case, that's not the case. So let's get your facts straight. If you wanna argue, let's argue. Okay, so there's environmental reasons. That area of Pohakuloa, that aquifer, runs from that sacred mountain that I'm talking to you about. The water from that mountain trickles down. Island aquifers aren't fully understood. And this telescope, if it were to be built, will be 12 stories high, one of the largest buildings in the state. It's breaking conservation district land use codes. So we have codes and it's being broken by the state who's allowing this to happen. And they would have to bomb 20 feet into our mountain where they would store hazardous waste. So that's another issue. This is one of the last areas on our mountain. So there's more than 13 telescopes already up there that we're not happy about. They've cut our mountain and made it shorter because they need a flattened area so that they could put their telescopes on it. This area where they wanna build this telescope is one of the last untouched places of the mountain. And one thing that they haven't figured out yet is when you put these structures up, what we're wondering about is how will you affect the winds because our mountains keep us safe. And as indigenous people, we know that. We understand our mountains. And Mauna Kea keeps us safe. And so when you put a big telescope that's going to stand so high in the air and you're going to redirect the winds, what happens to the people? So we're not only looking at environmental reasons. We're not only looking at policy reasons. We're not only looking at potential atmospheric changes reasons. But now we're going to talk about that genesis point. Mauna Kea today is still used to house our burials for our Ivi Kupuna, our ancestral remains. At the time of the white man's arrival, our people were dying. We were dying, we were sick, we weren't immune to the diseases coming our way. Where did we go? A lot of our people, they went to the mountain. The amount of burials that are around Mauna Kea aren't even known, and the ones, I'm an archeologist, I'm an anthropologist, there are hundreds of shrines that are all around our mountain that are ignored, that are taken apart, or that are destroyed for development. So that's a lot. I feel like that's a lot. That made me sad. Now I feel sad. Now I'm going to try to lift the vibration. I feel like that's real heavy. So in thinking about Pohakuloa, this military base, and thinking about Mauna Kea, this sacred, sacred space, this sacred mountain that we have been birthed from, and thinking about Okinawa, and thinking about Gohan, I have to say, thank God I'm here tonight. Thank God I'm with women who aren't afraid. Being brown, being indigenous, and speaking up for the rights of the earth, it's scary. You can get killed for this work. Just doing it is already a threat to our lives, but not doing it, we don't know what that means for the next generation, and it's not worth it. So we have to speak. Every single one of us has to speak. So if you stood, I've met different people in this room, and if you stood on the front lines of any movement to keep somebody or someplace safe, I say thank you. We say thank you. Thank you for that. I don't even need to know. I would love to know, but I'm gonna say thank you. If you're indigenous, if you're native, if you come from a people who have been oppressed and you're sitting here tonight still breathing, take that breath in and take that breath out and own it because you're still alive and you're still here. And that's a win. And so in going back to this love story, one of the biggest lessons of this ancestral love ah, that maybe will be written about a day, but not today, <laughs> is I, I'm offering, I learned to offer beyond just a romantic love. 
And so in standing here, I come with not only a request that you help us and you remember us on our sacred mountain and in Hawaii and in Okinawa and in Guahan, not only think of us with prayers and help us in ways of writing or donating or whatever way it is that you can help us, but in, in offering ourselves to you as well to build. You know, how do you, how do you kill a he'e? You don't go for the tentacle, you go for the head. And that's what we're going for. We're not going for tentacles anymore. We're going straight for the head and it starts through connections. And so I'm offering this chant to the warriors in this room, to the ancestors who we can't see, to the 400, the 4,000, the 400,000 who are always with you, because I know they're always with me. And it's a chant that we do on our sacred mountain. It's a chant that we will be doing if we end up on those front lines again. And so next time, if you didn't have a connection to that telescope and you didn't know about our movement, now you do. And I'm hoping we don't have to go back up. But if we do, I'm not going to leave my people behind. And, and neither will I leave you. Ko aina, Keisha. Ku aina. I will stand with you. And ko kai. Ku kai, Tina. From mountain to ocean, here's a chant for all the warriors and for all the lands and for all the warriors to come. Ku alinda kahei kapu ku kaulani. Ku a no o a pa a ku lana ku haka kau ke awa vai ku a ku papa ku ku ka ima kani kama kani o kalani kama kani ula kama kani ho nu ho o hei hei ho o hei hei ke a ka kapu ke a ka ku a no a no ke a ka ku ka he ka he ku ki a ima una ku a nu e nu e e ku ku pa u e ku ho ho e ku i ki ku e ku kaulani a ku a ku mauta mana la a kapu a wa ke thank you for having us Uh, uh, we've been asked that question a couple nights in a row now, and it's always by a woman. <laughs> I really appreciate it because it gives us a chance to reflect. It has been really hard. Like we, I wasn't crying this much in the beginning. <laughs> um, but uh, what we said last night was that We've been laughing a lot together. And though we have, the three of us have um, like sort of known of each other and maybe met each other a couple times before this, we haven't spent time together before. Um, so as hard as it is, what I realized last night was that you can be angry alone or you can be angry together. And um, over the past week, I just like, I got to be with these two women and I got to, I gained two sisters that like after this, we're, we're not just going to go home and forget about each other. We're going to be part of each other's lives for a long time. And I feel so fortunate for that because I, I knew of Keisha and Ruth, be Ruth before and I was like, oh, I wish I could be their friends. <laughs> and now I'm not just their friends, but I'm like their sisters in the struggle. Um, so yeah, it's really hard. And Today I just felt on the verge of tears all day and I didn't really know why. And I'm sorry for snotting all over the microphone. But, <laughs> but yeah, we, we've been laughing too, a lot. And it, felt, it feels really good. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, everything that Tina said, I echo. Um, laughing and I think just, I don't know being funny together like just trying to we, we like we've been picking on each other um mm -hmm. in loving loving ways uh peaceful ways um but yeah laughing and i don't know i felt like we just it's like we kind of just knew of each other but then now we're family and so i think that's important is having become family over just this one week um has been really important uh, for our solidarity work, even just with each other. Um, because now I'm like, okay, I have a sister now in Hawaii Island, you know, whom I can help and I know she will have my back. I have a sister from Okinawa um, and Oahu who will, who will also have my back when I move back home to Guahan. Um, sometimes the movement can feel lonely. Um, and I'm going to school in Hawaii, so I'm not even at home. 
So knowing that I have these two, even just back in Hawaii, um, it just feels really good. Um, and I think that's how we've taken care of ourselves is by taking care of and nurturing this relationship. Yeah. I'm just going to repeat everything they said because it sounds so good. But, uh, but it's also true. That's also why I have to say it. Is, um, yeah, we've laughed a lot. And um, we've, we've been busting out a lot of native jokes, which are always fun, uh, putting twists on our... <laughs> On, on the places we come from and the things we were growing up being told, um, which has been a lot of fun. And, and just like echoing what Keisha said, you know, we're lucky. We found each other so young. I'm 30, around, she's older, <laughs> she's younger. I'm the middle child. I, I, I thrive in this space because I can get away with things because nobody's looking at me. Um, oh, middle, ch middle children, I see you. <laughs> But, um, but I think of like these like really amazing sisterhoods um, of like these elder women that I really look up to, um, Auntie Winona LaDuc, Auntie Chief Kayleen Sisk, Auntie LaDonna, um, Auntie Karina Gold. Um, I think of these women who have found each other later in life and I was thinking, holy, like, and they're doing magnificent work in uniting our peoples. And so, you know, when it comes time, if it should come time to go on Mauna Kea, like we have those alliances and it's more than an alliance, it's a relationship. And so it's like, wow, like, you know, all these people potentially could come help us or help us spread the message. And for us being so young, I'm just like, man, I want to get old and I want to do this again. And I still want to pick on Tina because she's the youngest. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's a lot of laughing, a lot of laughing because it does get sad. It does get heavy. It does get depressing. And um, the best way to lift that heavy energy is to laugh it off. Just one more, because you're Uchinanchu. When I was in Okinawa with these women who'd been fighting for decades, um, and also meeting with each other every few years for decades, um, we, did, we did such heavy stuff for a week, and then at the end of the week, we all danced, and they were like busting out the kachashi and stuff. And I, I took note of that. We haven't danced together yet, but tonight's our last night, so maybe. <laughs> I heard something about a base resistance movement in Jeju Island, Korea. Do you guys have relationships with them? Do you know anything that's current that's going on with them? Uh, I don't know the specifics, but um, yeah, we have uh, the International Women's Network Against Militarism has uh, partners in South Korea working um, around the Jeju issue. Yeah. On the island that I'm from, we had we we are actually able to fundraise and send um, Pua Anna on. He's from our island, and he went to the recent um, like a peace camp, and it was at Jeju, and um, he went and he attended. And so, like I think in like um, like I don't I don't know a lot, but we do we do have people on island, and they kind of it's really cool how it how it works is you know I think folks are taking uh, Kuleana or responsibility over these places that they're connected to if they remember, and like Pua Anna is a Pua Anna is a Korean. His descendant, and so it meant a lot to send him specifically to go, so he could learn about how to help his people and reconnect with his own heritage. Um, so I don't know a lot, but we do have people on our island as well. So, uh, what about the Endi Endangered Species Act? Are you able to use that? And uh, all of these places are extremely important environmentally. Seems like you should be able to uh, stall it off at least. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, for Guahan in particular, if you ever read an environmental impact statement, the military will acknowledge th things such as the Environmental um, Endangered Species Act. Um, and they recognize that there could be potential dangers and risks for engaging in particular trainings and activities, um, which violate <laughs> the Endangered Species Act. But they just are. They just say, "Oh, we'll just we just need to do um, further consultation um, with folks, or um, we'll figure out ways to better mitigate uh, what's going to happen." So they know full well that there are problems and that they're violating their own um, laws or their own rules, um, and yet they still find some sort of way to find a loophole or bypass it. Um, so yeah, it's it's unfortunate because. We try to use the Endangered Species Act um, to help support our efforts, um, and yet they're often those efforts are often ignored um, 
but we still try anyway. We still use it because that's things that America came up with and imposed on us. So we try to use it. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. It's even interesting to see how different agencies help each other. Yeah. So sometimes the EPA still works with the DOD and they just try to hide certain things and they try to work things out together. I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying that, but we all know that's true. Um, but yeah, it's scary because they just kind of help each other out. And it's like, how are you, how, like, how, who are we supposed to hold accountable and how when they can't even like follow things that they put in place properly? Just doesn't make any sense. Um, but like I said, we try anyway. That's a great question. Yeah. You could use a, a lawsuit, you know, if you've got some environmental organizations in, in on it. Yeah, um, in Okinawa, they've tried that. Um, and uh, they... The ruling was not in their favor, but that was based on the 2012, I think 2012 EIS, uh, which now we know that EIS uh, wasn't particularly accurate because they didn't know anything about the seabed. So that's another opportunity um, to try to challenge again based on the presence of endangered species, specifically the dugong. Um, and a, a group of Okinawans, I think Hideki Yoshikawa, I'm sorry, Hideki, if like he watches this video and I pronounced or I got his last name wrong. Uh, but they're going to DC, um, I think this month or next month, um, to discuss with the Commission on Marine Mammals um, about uh, the about the threats to the dugong. But it's complicated also because the dugong has already left Oda Bay, um, probably because of the construction of the seawall. I, don't, I think they went over it well, but like just touching upon like what Keisha said, like on our island there was a case where the military base was gonna destroy um, Palila habitat, which is an endangered bird, and the Sierra Club sued. And basically, what happened was the project was rerouted. It wasn't enough to stop it, and so they found you know they created their own loophole in this system, and then also building like on um, on things that Keisha's talked about is like you know being iced out from the actual reports that are being conducted, like sometimes things are so sensitive that you can't even get your hands on previous re reports to assess the validity of the most recent one that was done. And that's a tactic to help us, to force us to forget that things that, things that we remember. And then so the next generation, like the longer, the more they're able to block us out from these documents, the less and less that we're able to know. And then another one for our island is like, we have this uh, shorebird that used to nest in this area where the military base currently is, and it's the Uau'u. And, the military base doesn't let us on the base. The habitat is already so destroyed because the sounds of these bombs, the shaking of the earth, like that kind, like I'm a practitioner, practitioner. And so like these loud sounds and vibrations shake the earth so rapidly, so intensely that fishes change. Their habits change. They won't come back for months or years after repeated bombing. And the same thing can happen with our bird relatives. And so, you know, it's, it's a combination of the projects being rerouted, not being given full information, and then also just like so much in the environment has changed and continues to change and the, by not allowing us onto the base, not allowing us to have independent studies done, it's just creating, they're just manufacturing reports that tell us projects are just fine, um, even though the military is the largest global polluter. I just wondered if you're connected with the people who stopped the bombing of PAK in Puerto Rico. Yeah, um, uh, we had we had one representative from Puerto Rico come all the way to Okinawa for our meeting in 2017, um, and man, her name is Dominga. Her presence was just so incredible. So yeah, that struggle um, is a real inspiration. And then we also have um, a member of Women's Voices named Becca Garrison, who is. Um, from California, but has, has done research in Vieques, in Guahan, and in Hawaii. Um, so she's building those connections, yeah. Um, also Kyle Kajihiro, um, whom we saw earlier, as well as Auntie Terry Keiko Olani, they also have, um, and Hananiki Trask, they've also established connections um, with people from Vieques, yeah. And then uh, the Koho Olave movement, um, we still have elders around, and so um, Auntie Maxine Kahaule Leo, um, Auntie Terry, there's other elders around as well from our, our previous movement that is still around um, that also help us.
I just wanted to say that my activism focuses on Okinawa. If you only have one minute to do something for Okinawa, you can go to my Twitter, and in one minute you can send off a letter to your senators and a member of Congress. Just go to John Reinch on Twitter, J-O-N-R-E-I-N-S-C-H. It's the top tweet in tweet. Uh, one minute, and, and your, your senators and Congress person will know. <laughs> Yeah, we would really appreciate that because um, a small contingent of us went to visit our federal representatives, uh, our representatives to Congress just um, in January. And um, we went to Tulsi Gabbard's office and her staffer didn't know anything about the Henoko issue. Um, this was right after construction had started. So, you know, our islands, people forget about them because they're small. Um, and any reminder that we exist would be so helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, my question was for Ruth. So I grew up in Waikoloa for 15 years, and um, my nephews are there, my sister's raising her family, and I'm wondering if uh, anyone on the island is specifically testing um, for depleted uranium in kids who you know, grow up on the island. Or, um, I don't know, any other scientific process for seeing the effects of that? I don't know if you heard me, sorry. I did. She asked about um, depleted geranium and the effects on the certain area downwind from the base. So I went and I had a meeting with the mayor, Mayor Kim, and I highly, highly encouraged Mayor Kim that we need to conduct independent studies regarding the health impacts upon our people because these studies haven't been conducted by the military. The military has conducted their own studies and said there is depleted uranium and there's absolutely no risk to anybody because it's not moving. We know where every single particle is. That's not what Dr. Pang said. Right, and so I went, you know, I went with Uncle Ron and I went with Uncle Jim and I sat with him and then he ignored me the whole time and then I just ended up like yelling at him because he wasn't, you know, he couldn't acknowledge a indigenous woman in the room, especially of somebody of a descent of the place he's talking about. And so he didn't listen. So what's being done now? I know Dr. Lauren Pang, I don't know if he still is, but he's been monitoring the wind patterns. And he's been able, you know, he's the one who's noticed the cluster data of intense um, cancer rates in certain parts of the island. That's been done. Um, Mayor told me to find the people who are sick and to have them come out and tell their stories publicly, which totally puts them at risk. Because if it was found true that there was depleted uranium issues on our island, every single place that the U.S. has caused contamination would need to have these studies done. And so I told the mayor, people would get killed if I was to get their names and their faces. And, he's, and I said, could I do it anonymously? I was willing to do the study. He said, no, I need to hear from them. Are you crazy? Are you crazy? We know people get killed over doing this work. The last thing I'm gonna do is put our women and children at risk. And so I don't know, right now there's an individual researcher named Drake Logan and she came out and she took some samples, um, some air quality samples from different places across the street and then like upwind and she's running samples right now of the, um, the air particles that she's collected and then she also took like some dust samples to see it's not directly in Waikoloa, but there is, you know, on the community's end, we, st we still are trying to find a way um, to test for some type of data, community science, um, so that, you know, the county will at least do their due diligence to keep the citizens safe if the U.S. government isn't gonna listen. So we're trying, but we're not at that specific place yet. Um, would it be all right if I make uh, a plug about some local organizing work that's happening? Um, first off, I just wanted to really express my gratitude for um, the three of you um, uh, coming all the way out here. I'm sorry, my voice is kind of sick. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, um, just express my gratitude for the three of you coming all the way out here to share your wisdom that's really I feel representing the movements and the people that you come from and being able to um, really bring that here and, and share that with us. Like I've really learned a lot and um, as someone who's really committed to anti-war, anti-militarism work, especially in the Pacific, I'm really just, um, yeah, it means a lot to me to hear that. Um, uh, 
something that I was thinking throughout the presentation is that uh, you know all these uh, weapons and uh, um, bombs and planes and things they don't come from nowhere, right? And uh, Seattle is actually a major uh, manufacturing hub for these uh, uh, you know uh, military machines, especially uh, Boeing, which is the second largest uh, weapons manufacturer in the world, and um, some of us in this room are trying to do some work to kind of unearth that and see what are the connections, where are these, these bombs and these planes going? And so um, if anyone wanted to uh, connect with me about that, uh, come talk to me um, because we do live here in Seattle and this, I, I really do believe that if we are in solidarity with these people around the world that um, we should uh, be aware of these things that are uh, being created in our backyard which are um, going around the world and hurting people and poisoning people and the land and um, the creatures of the, of the world, right? Um, and I also wanted to ask if that's kind of an angle that um, any of the three of you have uh, discussed or like explored in your own work um, uh, before in terms of like the production of the equipment that is used in the bombing and things. Uh, <laughs> I haven't explored that angle, but I've been hearing about it. We heard about a little bit about it last night in Portland, um, and I think that's super exciting. Like we talk about the hee, and Ruth Ruth pointed out you don't um, you don't kill a hee by cutting off a ten a tentacle. You kill it by at the head, you know. Um, and as we have been traveling around and talking about um, the local manifestations of this global problem. It's really interesting to hear about how different communities see this, um, see empire in their own backyard. And so I think that's a great strategy and we'd love to stay connected and learn more about what you, what you do. You're the perfect person we've been looking for this whole time. <laughs> we've been talking to a lot of people, but we've been talking to a lot of like older generation. And so we've been like hoping and like praying that we'd get young faces out um, because we already need to start connecting. And so for me, this is my first time being exposed to like the full extent, not even full, like I feel like it's still just like a glimpse into what you folks are experiencing here um, and how, you know, like our, our futures of like envisioning what this demilitarization look like is gonna be very, very different here compared to us as Islanders. You know, for like our bases, we could just demilitarize them and put our people right back on it. You know, it's not that far away, um, but at the same time, like the way that the island functions and the ecosystem is, we can put it right back into the ecosystem and we can start to dismantle the parts that don't fit, that weren't meant to ever exist. And I feel like, yeah, again, like just being here, I've, I've learned a lot. I've been waiting for somebody like you to come forward, and I'm so happy that you did um, because we definitely want to connect. And one of my main mentors, uh, Jim Albertini, as soon as he found out I was coming here, like he's an old-time activist. Like he's been going for 40 years. And every morning and night, I fall asleep to like him talking to me for like two to three hours about this stuff. And he's probably told me a lot about this and it didn't fully hit me till I got here, which is a great experience. Um, but we have cards or, or whatnot, and we'd love to hook up. Um, because they do, they have showings of these like these large violent machines and they're sold by like senators as like for the keiki, like for the children and they have like, you know, visit visit the day and like our, our families are going out not fully knowing, you know, like what these war machines are actually used for and um, being able to, you know, intelligently tell them like they, these are places that they're being built. I think that's really powerful. So in short, we want to connect with you. <laughs> Um, okay, well, those are all really great questions, comments, and plugs, and if there are no really pressing questions for the mic, um, I think we're going to have to wrap up. We're really lucky to get this much extra time with our guests, um, but I'm really happy to let everybody um, still congregate in the back and, uh, and just make it a slow goodbye with um, extra questions and comments. Um, sound good? So could we please get one last really big round of applause.